Hi, Jimmy here, and uh, I am an archaeologist by training. Uh, I have a research master's degree in archaeology. I've worked in field archaeology and research archaeology in various capacities. And so I try to keep up with the archaeology news. And part of that is, when I see a, a skeleton that I don't recognise on the internet, I will click on it to see where it's come from. And we've just got 50 new ones. <laughs> So this is the news that's come out in the last few weeks that in the village of Assum in Denmark, in, in Finn, I think it's pronounced Finn, uh, which is kind of the middle bit of Denmark and uh, kind of in that, in that bit of water with the two bridges, I think, either side, um, they have found, they have found 50 skeletons and five cremation burials from the Viking Age. And they have been dated to the 9th and 10th centuries, so like bang in the middle of the Viking Age, which is very cool. And 50 new skeletons is a lot of new skeletons, and that's very exciting news for a number of reasons. And if you read the reports, you will see that uh, amongst the skeletons we have a very cool high-status woman's burial, which is a wagon burial. And a wagon burial basically means that this woman died and was buried in a wagon, possibly the wagon that she used to trundle around with and travel around, um, which is really interesting in itself because when we have this sort of a burial, you can kind of tell it's high status and important because that wagon's been wasted. Whether you're, whether you're traveling for trade or you're traveling for warfare, whatever it is, these vehicles are worth a lot. And something else that's worth a lot, I think, is peace of mind, which is the subject of today's sponsorship. Hello, you find me in my car, holding my camera in my hand because I'm in a rush. And when I'm in a rush, the last thing I want to worry about is my internet security. And that is why I use NordVPN. And you should know you use NordVPN as well. And you should use it by going to nordvpn.com forward slash Welsh and using the code Welsh at checkout. Because if you do that, you will get four months extra on a two-year subscription to NordVPN, and it's all completely safe with their 30-day money-back guarantee. You've got perfect peace of mind. You get next-generation internet security. You get encryption. You get help with things like phishing scams, man-in-the-middle attacks, all these horrible things that people on the internet want to do to you, which isn't very nice of them. You also, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Welsh and use the code Welsh at checkout... We'll be able to take advantage of things like getting around internet national boundaries, which shouldn't exist. I think we all agree, and so does Nord. You can do things like watch YouTube from Moldova, because Moldovan YouTube has way fewer ads, which is lovely because they're just getting more and more and more, and it's getting on everybody's nerves. And the best way for you to experience NordVPN's splendid virtual private network and internet security features is by going, as I say, to nordvpn.com, forward slash Welsh and using the code Welsh at checkout. Full disclosure, they've given me NordVPN because I'm doing these these sponsored videos for them and it's cracking. It's really good. I've got it on my laptop and I've got it on my mobile phone. It's really, really good. So pop over to nordvpn.com forward slash Welsh. Use the code Welsh at checkout. Give it a whirl. After your 30 day guarantee is over, I'm pretty sure you'll want to stick with it. So there you go. Internet security. Now get out of my car. See how seamless that ad read was? That's why I'm making the big bucks on YouTube. It's the same with a ship burial. You can't sail a ship if you burn it to ashes and then pile a mound of earth on top of it. You can't use a wagon for travel and trade if you've buried somebody in it and you've put a mound of earth on top of it. So this is somebody who is important enough that they took uh, a wagon that was hand-built because every everything was necessarily handmade in this period because there are no machine tools and they bury it all so that's all gone she was also buried with some lovely glass beads and a knife with a silver wrapped handle silver is obviously a status material it speaks to your ability to use this material to, to make jewelry from it instead of keeping it to spend on food so this is a high status woman's burial um, another burial has two three lobed brooches in it and three lobed brooches are a really fun artifact because uh, there's a theory that I subscribe to actually that they're based off Carolingian sword fittings so the theory goes basically that um, Old Norse settlers or raiders saw these sword fittings 
in France or in the Frankish Empire and went, those look really cool, but instead of using them as sword spacers, what if we upcycled them and turned them into brooches? And then they take them back and they start making brooches in this design. You put a pin on the back, you use a pair of them, and you use them to hold up your apron dress, your classic Old Norse apron dress, right? Your smokker. And that's how it worked, as far as this theory is concerned. And we have two of these brooches, uh, and they look gorgeous. They look absolutely beautiful. Um, so that's really, really cool. It's nice to when you see these recognisable artefacts that already have a fun story and a typology attached to them. It's always nice to add another one of them to the collection, or another pair of them to the collection, in this case. Um, I believe the woman who had those on was also buried with a single red bead around her neck, and that's such a strong look, right? That's, that's going to be a really cool reenactor. In, in like a year's time, somebody will have made a replica of those brooches and the bead, and someone will appear at a reenactment as one of the awesome women, and that's going to be really awesome. I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Um, no refunds. Uh, what else have we got? We've also got animal head. I, it looks like an animal head brooch to me, like the brooch in the hand at the top of the article looks like an animal head brooch, which I thought were diagnostically Gotlandish. So I thought they were kind of diagnostically, culturally diagnostically, they were Swedish. Um, but we have found them in other places. I think we've got them in Ireland and mainland Great Britain as well. So I might be wrong on that, but uh, I'd heard a theory somewhere that these things are generally considered a Swedish look, like a Swedish artefact. Um, but as the writers of the report say, the initial report on the excavation, which was done by archaeologists from the local museum, from Museum Odense, from the Odense Museum, um, they say that this site has artefacts from further afield, so non-Danish artefacts. Uh, one of the examples they use is rock crystal, which doesn't occur natively, and so must have been imported from somewhere where it does, like Norway. Um, and it makes sense, right? The place where this is, if you look at it, it's bang in the middle of Scandinavia, and it's on the sea route east to west. So it makes sense that things are being imported. We know that the Old Norse had a massive trading network that went to the Volga, uh, all the way over to effectively the Atlantic coast, and south into the Mediterranean. So we know that there was a lot of trade happening and lots of things were coming in from all over the place. The site itself was found during uh, work, which is how a lot of sites are found. They're found when a building is being built. They're found when uh, a car park is being uncovered and foundations are going in for a new building. And that's what's happened here. This was found when the local electric company, the electrical firm, wanted to expand their electric grid, and so either they found something and alerted the archaeologist, or if it was in the UK, I would assume there was an archaeologist on a watching brief, which is where uh, you have an archaeologist who is stationed next to the digger bucket, literally watching the digging. That's why it's called a watching brief, because your brief is to watch what's happening. And if you see something that looks like it might be archaeology, you stop the work and you go in <laughs> with a trowel before the bucket goes through somebody's skull, which is hopefully how this happened and all of the skulls are okay. Um, but the fact that we have so many skulls with so many teeth in them is really, really exciting because as we see in the report, which is all in the description, it means that ancient DNA analysis might be possible. In fact, it means we can do a lot of analyses on these skeletons and that means that they can tell us a lot because we've got 50 of them from the same site, which is a rarity. When they dug the area around Coppergate for the Jorvik Viking Centre in York, I think they only got three full skeletons, and they're not in the best condition, some of them. So the fact we've got 50 pretty well-preserved skeletons means we can do a lot of analysis on them. Now, 50 years ago, this sort of DNA analysis would be very controversial, even 30 years ago, 20 years ago, because you'd need quite a lot of samples. It's quite a destructive type of analysis. But now it's not as destructive because you can clone the sample, which means that you can take a much smaller sample from your skelly bone and clone it as many times as you need so you can do lots of different tests on it, which is great. So hopefully we'll be able to do some really cool ADNA analysis, which can tell you all sorts of things. It can tell you potentially where these people were from what their background might have been geographically or ethnically, um, 
were these people all related? Is this a family burial ground? Is this four generations of the same family? Does that imply that this is a noble burial ground or a royal burial ground? We know that this, this village and this area and Odense became very important at this time. So is this part of the ruling elite being buried here over generations? We don't know, but ADNA can help us answer some of that. And when I talk about ethnic and genetic backgrounds, a lot of people get upset because they, for some reason, like to think of this as a very insular community. The Old Norse were very insular people. They were all, you know, blonde-haired and blue-eyed, which is utter nonsense. Like, we have so much evidence that debunks that. And when there's diversity, people often jump to slavery. They say, oh, well, if this person had, a, a, you know, a back, a, as both... Britonic and Old Norse, that one of them must have been enslaved, but there's no reason to suppose that when we know that trading settlements were established and Old Norse people also moved to established places like the Byzantine Empire and set up shop there as traders. There's a lot more nuance. It's why I bang on about nuance on this channel so much, because life was just as complicated a thousand years ago as it is today, if not more so when you factor in the fact that Europe had an extremely important religious aspect to its everyday life. Like, everywhere in Europe, religion was pretty important, no matter what your religion was. So if you imagine, you know, you fall in love with or you decide you want to start a family with an old Norse um, pagan who's moved in and set up shop as a trader in the Byzantine Empire, much to the annoyance of your orthodox Christian family, um, you can imagine how that might play out. It's a really good idea for a film. Robert Eggers, if you're watching, I can provide my own costume. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's really important that we have this site and all of these people's bones because it will give us, whatever the information is, it will give us a lot more information on how life was lived. And we'll be able to see if there are you know, genetic markers for diseases and how prevalent those might have been in this community. Uh, all of this amazing stuff that we can do with DNA analysis now, you know, what they might have looked like, hair color and eye color for goodness sake. It's just crazy the stuff you can work out from a shard of bone or a fragment of tooth. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So, full disclosure, my camera ran out of battery, so I went for a bath um, while it was charging. And it really hasn't charged very much, but, you know, these are the things that we deal with when we do YouTubes. Um, the other thing that makes this exciting is it gives people like me, historical reenactors, and a lot of the people watching this, I know, lots more information, because we rely on a fragment of the past that we're trying to recreate, right? We try to recreate clothes through fragments of fabric, we try to guess at the cut of a, a specific garment through maybe a quarter of what's left of it sometimes, if we're lucky. And the artifacts that we're going to get from the reports that start coming out are going to allow us to make lots more replicas of lots more of these things, which is very exciting. So hopefully in the next couple of years we'll see uh, people making replicas of the three-lobed brooches that were found, for example, or the animal head brooch, or the knife with the silver wrapped around the handle. It would be really cool if we see that, and we, and we will. This is how this develops, is, you know, the, the site is found, it's kept secret for a period of time, and this one was basically revealed six months after it was found because uh, of various reasons, but one of the main reasons that archaeologists do that is people will loot archaeological sites. It happens a lot. People will turn up during the night with metal detectors and they will try to steal the artifacts, which is illegal and a dick move. So very often that's why news is six months after it's been found, because it, it can take six months. It can take two years to fully excavate the site, get everything noted down, take all the artifacts and the remains away. Um, and write up reports that are then ready to be sent out to the press. So that's why this has taken a long time. But the, that's the basic production line, right, for reenactors is something will be excavated, a report will be published on it, uh, somebody will get hold of that report, they will then take the information from that report and use it to make their replica, or they will use it to um, inform other people in their group, or a, a specialist will find it and make a replica and then talk to reenactors who will then make their own replicas based off that information. So, you know, it's all about 
<clears throat> spreading the information around, this grey uh, this gray information that can often be just lost in archives that are difficult to get to. So hopefully what we'll get here, um, because this is a museum excavation, is we'll get a nice display in the museum, in Odense maybe, um, and possibly like a, a fully illustrated guidebook or something like that to go along with the exhibit. Hopefully it will all be digitized and the information will be available. And a lot of the Scandinavian uh, universities and museums are really good for that. Um, places like the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum and the National Museum of Scotland, National Museum of Wales as well, are all pretty good with digitization. So hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get all of this information on this amazing site because a, a two kilometer square early medieval burial ground with fifty skeletons in it is very, very exciting. I can't, I cannot overstate how exciting this find is. It's really, really cool. Um, and it's going to be really, really important and tell us lots of things about who these people were, where they were from, whether they were related, uh, if this ends up being a royal family burial ground that's going to be super, super interesting. Uh, you know, we might be able to pinpoint which royal family or dynasty these people were from. That's taking a bit of a leap of faith, I know, but still, that's jumping the gun, but, you know that is among the options that we have because of this ancient DNA analysis that we could be doing on these skelly bones. Um, so it's super, 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 super interesting. Hopefully we'll get loads of info. We might get some fun 3D reconstructions. I love 3D reconstructions um, of some of the people buried here. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I'm still a bit poorly, so I do sound a bit rough. I, I'm sorry I'm sounding a bit rough recently. A really nasty cold, but yeah. Yeah. Um Dunabe Thyochvotri would win hi. I hope that you've enjoyed this little video. If you wanna have more of these little sort of here's what's happening in archaeology news videos, then feel free to let me know in the comments. Um I'm doing this because people have, have shared this a couple of times on on the Patreon and the Discord and people have sent me DMs with it, so uh, if you want to support the channel financially we have the Patreon link in the description and there's a Discord channel that's become a lovely community. There's like a couple hundred people on it now. Um and it's super cool and super supportive. Everybody on there is awesome and looking after each other, which is beautiful. Um, if you just want to support the channel in the traditional way, like and subscribe and so forth. Um, yeah. Otherwise, Diochmaur and Willio. Thank you very much for watching. And until the next time, Tantronissa, Huilamatro. Bye for now.